This lecture is on the rise of the Franks. The Franks were a very successful Germanic kingdom, and you can see this in their evolution from Charmander to Charmillion to Charlemagne. I'm being a little silly here, but I, when I looked up Charlemagne, this is one of the images that showed up, and I thought this was hilarious. But it does kind of mirror what we're talking about. I want to give you an example of a Germanic kingdom that is going to work with the Catholic Church to become very powerful and to try and bring more peace and stability and in a sense to try and restore the Western Roman Empire. And you can see that, I think, best with the Franks. And when you hear Franks, think modern France. So to talk a little bit about the relationship between the Catholic Church and the Franks, we need to emphasize that, first of all, originally they were not Christians. They were followers of various pagan religions. Uh, so they were polytheists who worshipped many gods. And one thing I should also point out is the word Frank means free. So these were a group of people who emphasized kind of their own, what can I say, autonomy. They don't want to be told what to do by people. So it's kind of striking that one of them would convert to Christianity, one of the kings of the Franks, a man named Clovis. And this is an image depicting his baptism. And like I said, it's kind of interesting that he would convert to Christianity, especially because he was known as a really ruthless guy, right? Clovis was just known, I mean, I don't want to go into deep detail about it, but, you know, he, he would kill family members who got in his way politically. So he's a pretty ruthless guy. So why would someone like that become a Christian? Well, the story goes that he was married to a Christian woman. And his wife, his Christian wife, was always telling him, you know, you really should convert to Christianity. You should believe in God. And he was getting ready to fight a battle. And he was basically wasn't sure if he was going to win. He was like, OK, Christian God, if you're real, let me win the battle. And he won the battle. Now, that sounds a bit like kind of what Constantine was doing, right? Not the exact same. But remember how I said earlier the Catholic Church was seen as a repository of supernatural power. There was a belief that, there, uh, that it had supernatural powers, basically. And that was something that was widely accepted. The question was not so much, you know, does such supernatural entities exist? But rather, which are the strongest? And the idea is, well, if this Christian God is strong, I should follow the Christian God. So that's, in a sense, why someone who is relatively ruthless would be willing to become a Christian, right? This Christian God seems pretty powerful. And, of course, this had political purposes, too, right? Made sense politically because it won the support of the Catholic Church, which is going to um, do all those things we talked about previously, help with learning, leadership, all those great things. And it also, of course, won the support of his Catholic subjects, right? He's going to be conquering including people who are Catholics. Well, he's a Catholic now too. Moreover, much, many of his enemies were not Catholics. So as he tried to build up his kingdom, he could portray his wars as holy wars, right? I'm not fighting these enemies for my own interests. I'm not fighting them to become richer. I'm fighting them for a God, right? If I expand the influence of my kingdom, that means expanding the influence of Catholicism, which I believe is the true religion. The more, the bigger my kingdom gets, the better that is for the Catholic Church, because I'm a Catholic who's working with the church. It's kind of the idea. So we can see again, as we talked about previously, how church and state are marrying. And through this marriage, you're going to have the rise of the Franks to become a very powerful kingdom, which will one day become modern France. Now, I have to introduce something new that we haven't talked much about in this class so far, and that's Islam. We'll be talking about it soon, don't worry. But the spread of Islam, the, its expansion, is going to become a serious issue for Europe. The uh, one thing I have to stress is that Islamic armies were very good, they were very powerful, and they're going to sweep out of Arabia, conquer northern Africa, and come into Spain and threaten France. It doesn't exist as modern France yet, but the key point I want to emphasize here is that Islam is on the doorstep. 
of Europe. In fact, it's conquered modern-day Spain. And this will lead to one of the famous battles in Western history, and it involves the Franks, the Battle of Tours. So, like I said, there, much of Spain has been conquered by Muslims, and there's pressure on the Frankish kingdom. Now, this time period is very complex because the king of the Franks was not really that powerful. He was kind of a puppet, and the puppeteer, the person pulling the strings, was a man named Charles Martel, who held the position of palace mayor. So he's using the king as like his puppet. Now, one thing I want to point out, Martel means the hammer, right? So Charles Martel is a tough guy. I, I think he gets the nickname, though, because of his victory at the Battle of Tours. But Charles Martel is a tough guy. So he's really the one in charge. He wants to train a professional army. He, in particular, he wants heavy infantry. He thinks heavy infantry, that is guys that are very heavily armed and armored, uh, he thinks they're the best thing to fight against the oncoming uh, Muslim troops. And he wants them to be a professional army. He wants them to do nothing but fight or train. Previously, Frankish soldiers, uh, for the most part, were part-time soldiers. They were peasants who you would call up to fight as you needed them. He says, that's not going to work. The Muslims are pretty much by this time, I think they're almost undefeated. They haven't, they don't usually lose battles. Um, so he needs a very powerful army, a professional army, if he's going to win. To do that, he needs money. So he really puts pressure on the Catholic Church to give him money. And naturally, the Catholic Church is like, you're supposed to be supporting us, not us supporting you. <laughs> and he almost gets excommunicated, which basically means getting kicked out of the church. Because he put so much pressure. But in the end, and this is one reason why I like to say church and state got married, doesn't mean they always get along. But in the end, the Catholic Church realized, yeah, if we lose, this is really bad. So we better help him out. Right? Married couples can fight. But ideally, eventually, they realize that for the good of the marriage, and, they're, and what's good for the marriage is good for both of them as individuals, they need to work together. And that's what happens here. And that's why I like to say church and state got married. Because there's a conflict, he wants money, the church doesn't want to give him the money, and it gets really bad, but they do resolve it. And what happens then is, thanks to the fact that Charles Martel is a good general, and he has a very good army, he actually defeats an Islamic invasion at Tours in France, deep in France, in fact. And this battle is very significant. There's no reason why Islamic forces could, should have needed to stop. I have to stress, and we'll talk more about this later, um, the caliphate, the Islamic empire, was extraordinarily powerful. And one reason we make a big deal about this victory by Christians during this time period is because during this time period, Christians usually lost. This is one of the few times they win. And if it wasn't for this victory, Islam could have kept going into Europe. And that would have meant for a very different history if you would have had a primarily Muslim Europe as opposed to a primarily Christian Europe. So this is a very, very important battle. Now, Martel knows what he's doing. He's very tough. He's very strong. He's very smart. The king is very weak. So eventually, Charles Martel will get rid of the king. He doesn't kill him. But he's going to make sure that his son will become the next king. And that leads to the establishment of what's called the Carolingian dynasty of the Franks. So we're still with the Franks. It's just a different dynasty, different families now ruling. And that sets the stage for the rise of a man named Charlemagne. Now, Charlemagne literally means Charles the Great, right? Charles the Great. So what made him so great, right? Why is he remembered this way? Well, first of all, I want to stress Charlemagne was not the son of Charles Martel. He was the grandson of Charles Martel. And the first king then, after Charles Martel um, pushes out the other fellow, is not Charlemagne's, it's Charlemagne's father. And his father continued to cultivate a good relationship with the Pope and supported the church. Right? He continues to cultivate a good relationship with the Pope, continues to support the church. And that brings us to Charlemagne. Now, Charlemagne literally means Charles the Great. And one thing I have to stress, Charlemagne is not the son of Charles Martel. He's the grandson of Charles Martel. So he's not the immediate king after Charles Martel establishes the Carolingian Empire. 
Now, Charlemagne's father, the son of Charles Martel, is careful to cultivate a good relationship with the Pope and is careful to support the Catholic Church. Charlemagne will continue this. All right, so this marriage between church and state continues, and it works really well. Charlemagne is able to continue to expand his territory, particularly against pagan Saxons, non-Christians. They have a very difficult relationship. The Saxons would often attack Charlemagne's lands. He would invade. They would promise not to do it again. Then they would attack again. And finally, Charlemagne did a couple things a Christian king isn't really supposed to do. He slaughtered several thousand Saxon prisoners, right? People who had surrendered in order to try and stop this and to put it to conquer, fully conquer the Saxons. And he also forced a number of them to convert to Christianity, which you're really not supposed to do. And so I highlight that just to emphasize sometimes this relationship between church and state, like I said, they're both profiting from it. It can also cause problems because in Christianity, you're not really supposed to force people to convert, right? It doesn't quite make sense. But he is going to do that. He's going to expand both his influence because he's a great warrior king. He knows how to lead troops into battle. He's very wise. And as he expands his territorial influence, of course, that expands the influence of the Catholic Church, which he's, in, he's partnered with. Now, as his realm expands, so too does the need for learning. Remember, we talked about how earlier, if you're going to administer territory, if you're going to levy taxes, you need records. You need to be able to read and write. You need to write down laws. You need to write books on how to conduct administration properly. And you also want to see, you know, the Greeks and the Romans, they were really smart guys. They had lots of wisdom. We want to have access to the books that they wrote. So because of this, Charlemagne will found schools, right? He's going to establish a lot of schools. So it's interesting. He's a warrior in a sense. He's got a sword in one hand. He has a book in the other. And he will also not just try and preserve old knowledge. He's going to bring together a lot of scholars. A lot of these, of course, are priests and is going to give them the support they need to try and make things better. So, for example, under Charlemagne, that's when lowercase letters are developed. The scholars he hires, they're like, it's kind of hard to read when everything's in capital letters. Uh, let's add that. And also, let's develop question marks. So not only are they trying to preserve old learning, they're also trying to innovate. Now, this knowledge is meant both for administration, but also remember, there's a close relationship here between church and state. One reason also to teach people how to learn to read and write is so they can better understand Christianity and better teach it to others. I don't want you to think that he's got a bunch of peasants in school. That's not what he's doing. They don't have that many schools. Rather, what it is, is people who are going to become priests and nobles. Those are the people who are going to be learning how to read and write. The nobles will help take care of administration. The church leaders will teach faith, but also to help take care of administration. And... This culminates, this close relationship between Charlemagne and the Pope, between the state and religion, will culminate in the Pope crowning Charlemagne Emperor in the year 800. And that's what you see in this image, the Pope crowning him Emperor. Incidentally, this happened on Christmas. So what a Christmas gift for Charlemagne. Now, one thing I have to stress, when I say crown him Emperor, when you hear the word emperor, you know, in this class, we talked about a lot of different emperors of several different civilizations. But if you were a person living in the year 800, there's only one emperor, and that's the Roman emperor. So what's key is Charlemagne has been such a successful king, so good at expanding his state, at administering it, at spreading Christianity, that he's being treated as a new Roman emperor. The last Western Roman emperor was Romulus Augustus back in the 5th century. 400 years later, I'm sorry, it would actually be a little bit uh, over 300 years later, it looks like the Western Roman Empire is back. They've got a new emperor and he knows what he's doing.